Father God, you revealed yourself to us long ago in Bethlehem when you came into this world as a tiny infant and as you lived among us, Lord, we saw you. Uh, Today, you continue to speak to us, you continue to reveal yourself to us in your word. And so as we listen to a story, probably that we've heard many, many times over again, we pray that we would hear it with... um, in in fresh new ways, in ways that continue to minister to us today, in ways that continue to point us to the good news of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would give us hearts and minds of understanding and insight, and we pray that you would apply your word to us as we have need. I ask too, Lord, for your blessing upon me and your Holy Spirit might work through me to bring this message to your people. In Christ's name, amen. So a couple of days ago, I was um, I, I came across this website, or it was a Facebook thing, or something that kind of piqued my curiosity. It was a picture of some of the best ways that expecting couples announce their pregnancy to their friends and family members on social media, and I had a whole long list of these pictures. And, and you, this has kind of become a trend where people who are you know couples expecting a child, they'll find a creative way to announce that on, usually on Facebook or other social media. And I took a couple of them and I thought I would just put them up here to see. Um, in case you can't quite make it out, it's a little two-year-old or so in a, in a crib. And the writing on the side of it says, eviction notice. Because, and then it kind of goes on to make it seem like this toddler's going to get kicked out of his crib because there's someone else that needs that crib by whatever, April of that following year. Um, One more, this is maybe a more common theme where you have a young family already overwhelmed with kids and the demands of parenting and you see mom there looking at, it's a pregnancy test that obviously is revealing good news, mostly, that another child will be joining the family and so you can kind of see how thrilled everybody is about that. And I got to thinking about that because the story of Luke that we read in, in the gospel this morning, is, it's a birth announcement. It really is. It's, it's, but it's, it far surpasses any of these birth announcements, any of the other ones that you'll ever find. In fact, it's the greatest birth announcement of all time. It's, and if you think about it, it's hard to compete with a choir of angels singing in the night sky, isn't it? But, but not only is the, is the form of the announcement really dramatic... More importantly, the content, the message of this announcement is world-changing, life-changing. And I want to spend a few minutes with you this morning reflecting on what that message is all about. Why is it good news? And, um, and we're, going to look really, we're going to look quickly at three things. We're going to look at how the, the announcement of Jesus' birth brings rejoicing rather than fear. It sends us into mission and um, it announces the good news of a Savior. Now, you'll notice that the first thing that the angels say is, do not be afraid. Now, you're a shepherd and you see the angels appearing. Um, It's easy to understand why they might be terrified. And the angel says, don't be afraid. I have heard it said, that that is one of the most frequently repeated commands in all of Scripture. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And that makes sense, I think, because we live in a world that is in so many ways filled with reasons to be afraid, to be fearful, to be uncertain, to be anxious. I think it would almost be Um, naive not to at least acknowledge the fact that in our country right now we're facing all kinds of uncertainty and polarity and division on a national scale. And fear in the midst of all that can be a very powerful motivator. Fear can be used to um, divide people, to make people sort of turn on each other politically, socially, whatever else. Fear can be you look in the news, North Korea promised, did you see that, a, a Christmas present. I highly doubt it will be socks wrapped under the Christmas tree, right? But there's fear again. The threat in this uncertain world. In your own life, 
I mean, you've got things that perhaps make you anxious about your future. Uncertainties about your job, maybe. About relationships. You've got plans for 2020, perhaps, all laid out, but you don't know how that's all going to work out, and so there's uncertainty. There's a sense of, of fear about that. So it's important to note that all through Scripture, God continually comes and says to his people, don't be afraid. But you know what? That's not the main reason that the shepherds were afraid, and it's not the main reason the angels command the shepherds not to be afraid. Shepherds understood that to see the presence of God, to see the glory of God revealed, was a life-threatening experience. I suppose even if they didn't know their Bibles, they would have figured that out when they're sitting in the darkness of this night in, uh, outside of, of Bethlehem, and all of a sudden the sky breaks open and the brilliance of heaven shines forth. That, would have, that itself, if you know nothing about what's happening, that would have been a terrifying experience. But shepherds, they probably had some understanding of what, the, what was happening. They probably had some sense that the glory of God, the presence of God himself was coming into the world. And they knew well enough what happened to Moses and to Isaiah and to Uzzah who touched the ark and others in the, in the Old Testament when the presence of God comes near, the, the people were terrified. It was, it was their undoing. It was a threat to their very existence because the holiness and the righteousness and the glory and the greatness of God is something that is far too overwhelming for fallen and sinful and broken human beings like you and I and like the shepherds. And so the shepherds are terrified because the presence of God is a threat to them. Now again, we sentimentalize the presence of God. You and I often talk about the presence of God and we make it something like, well, I feel God present here and we don't think twice about what that means. But for the presence of a holy and awesome God to come near, it is a threat. We can't stand by ourselves. We can't be in the presence of a holy God. And yet... The first words out of the angel's mouth to these shepherds is fear not. Don't be afraid. And then he goes on, he says, for I'm bringing you good news. Now that itself, that idea of good news is crucial. Because news is, well news is an announcement of something that has happened. It's not Behold, I bring you good advice for how you can experience the presence of God in your own life. Or behold, I bring you seven steps to a better encounter with God or something like that. It's good news. God has done something. God has acted. God has come near in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. It's news. The the birth of Jesus is news because of what God has done. It's not news because of what we now need to do. God has drawn near. And in verse 14, um, the angel explains, he says, actually this is the choir of, of angels that says, peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. The good news is that God has come near to make peace. And that right away suggests that First of all, by nature, we are not at peace with God. We are opposed to God. We stand against him. But God has come near, and the news is that God has made peace between us and him, between those who are in Christ. Through Christ, there is a way to be reconciled, a way to be restored to relationship with God. Through Christ, the presence of God can come into our lives. Through Christ, we can draw near to the holy and awesome and all-powerful God of the universe. And you see, that then gives reason for us to not be afraid of anything else. See, if you are at peace with the God of the universe, if you are reconciled to him, then your future is safe and secure in his care. Then you can be assured that whatever happens in this world does not happen apart from his care and his control. You can be certain about 
the plans that you have for tomorrow, next week, next year, your whole life long. You can be certain even in times of uncertainty and fear, you can simply say, but I belong to God. I am his child. Right? Fear. The, the gospel brings rejoicing rather than fear because God has come near to make peace with us. The other thing is, this birth announcement shows us that the gospel is a message for all people, for the nations. Um, I was talking, we were talking as a, as a family of, oh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about how, um, you know, different cultures and different groups have sort of a way of deciding who's in and who's out. And, and it's not, we're not saying that's right, we're just saying it is. And my daughter is in high school now, she says, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense because, it, look, this happens in high schools, doesn't it? There are groups of people who are in. They wear the right clothing. They associate with the right people. They talk in the right way. They pay attention to, you know, the right sports. They're the in group. And then there are people that don't quite fit in as well. Every culture, every group does this. You, we all have some definition of who belongs and, and who doesn't. Now, in first century Palestine, shepherds didn't belong. They were on the outside. Part of the reason was they were always in contact with animals, and animals would make you ceremonially unclean. You couldn't go up to the temple and worship, and, and worship and participation in the religious life of the community was so important that if you couldn't be a part of that, you were just kind of, you, you just didn't fit in with the rest of, of your people. So you were always excluded. You were always on the margins. And, and people, you know how it is when you're always on the outside, people begin to make assumptions about you. They begin to sort of cast a shadow on you. And we watched Home Alone a couple nights ago. You, you know, the, it's like a famous Christmas movie. And in the movie, there's this next-door neighbor who's this mysterious old man who lives by himself. And he's always appearing at night with a shovel, and he's shoveling the sidewalk. And, um, you know, he's kind of this marginalized figure. But, of course, all the neighborhood kids look down on, on him from their upstairs window. And when they peek out the window, they start telling stories about this guy that, yeah, he murdered his whole family with the shovel, and he's going to do it again. And... You know how it works like that when someone's on the fringes or on the outside, people, that's what we do. We make assumptions about them. We keep them at arm's length, and that's shepherds. Shepherds, because they were on the outside, people assumed they were dishonest. They assumed that they were thieves. They assumed all kinds of other, uh, made all kinds of other assumptions about the kind of people that shepherds were, and shepherds, as a result, were at the lowest margins of society. And yet, when it comes time to announce the birth of the Savior of the world, that's where God goes. That's where God sends the message first, to the shepherds, to the unclean, to those who the rest of society brushed off and rejected. Um, that fits with the overall theme of Luke's gospel. If you read through Luke's whole gospel, you'll find that Luke is always showing us how, how Jesus comes to bring good news for the poor and for the, for the marginalized. The gospel goes to those who everyone else would otherwise reject. Um, and if that's true, if that shows us that God's heart is to reach those even that other people would reject, then that begs the question of us. Do we share that same concern for those on the edges of our society? Do we have a concern to reach people who are on the fringes, the poor, the socially alienated, the rejected? Do we share that concern? Now there's a, sort of another side. It's kind of like two sides to the same coin. Jesus is or the angels are not just announcing that Jesus came to bring good news to the marginalized, but also good news to the nations. Right? If you look at verse 10, uh, again, the, angel, the message of the angel is, don't be afraid, I'll bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. And what, what the angel means to communicate by that is that the gospel did not just come as a message for the Jewish people. Jewish people had a sort of a tendency to think that they were God's special chosen ones and they and nobody else. But as you see the gospel going forth, you see that it's reaching, it's a message for the nations of the world. And of course, that's what the shepherds do. They go and they see the birth of Jesus and they verify what has been told to them. And guess what their immediate response is? 
the wonder of what they have seen then drives them into mission. Their immediate response there in verse, um, in verse 18 is that they go and they tell everyone. It's like they couldn't help themselves. The good news that they had experienced sends them out to tell others. And it's a message that since that time, Luke, of course, writes also the, God, the, the book of Acts in the New Testament, which records how the gospel then goes to the ends of the earth. Now, not all of us are called into missions. Not all of us are called. In fact, most of us are not going to be called to quit our jobs and go overseas. That's not what, how God usually works. But, but God does call us to be witnesses to the marvel and the wonder of the gospel. And so I want to encourage us in that this morning. I want us to see the Christmas story and the Christmas message as, as one that ought to give us a sense of urgency to tell others. A sense of urgency to pray for the nations. A sense of urgency to, to pray for those around us who do not yet know Jesus. I want to encourage us to have that same sense of urgency that the shepherds had, that we can't hold back. Do you have people that you're praying for? Do you have people in your life that you have conversations with? Do you have people in your life that you have a heart that they will come to know Jesus? Now one final way that the birth of Jesus, the announcement of the, Je- the birth of Jesus works to bring good news, and that's it's the announcement of a Savior. Um, if you look at verse 11, it says, Today in the town of David a Savior has been born. He is Christ. Now, we hear that kind of language all the time. We, you know, Jesus is the Christ. You know, Jesus Christ. We, but for most of us, the meaning of that just kind of goes over our head because we've heard it so many times, right? I, I don't know. You almost get to the point where you think Christ was like the last name, like Jesus Christ and Mary and Joseph Christ. And But in those days especially, that that word Christ was so important. It would have made everybody sit up and pay attention and probably be in astonishment because what they were hearing was that Jesus is the chosen one. The word Christ is just a, it's a Greek translation of a Hebrew word that means anointed or chosen. So really what the angel is, uh, what the angel is saying is he is the chosen one. He is the one that God has set apart He is God's chosen one. Now the question is chosen for what? In the Old Testament, there were really three things that a person would be anointed for. Um, Prophets were anointed. They were given the task of speaking on God's behalf, being a, a teacher or a messenger to the people. So you had to be a prophet. You had to be authorized by God to be that voice. Uh, to be that that spokesperson to the people. So a prophet was anointed to be a spokesperson. A priest was anointed. A priest was set apart to um, facilitate the relationship between God and his people. So that meant the priest had to deal with the sins of the people, and the priest was also anointed to bring the prayers of the people to God. And then finally, kings were anointed. Kings were anointed to exercise authority over God's people exercise justice, to implement the law. Prophet, priest, and king. What the angel is saying is that Jesus has come not to just to be another anointed in a long line, but to be the anointed. The true prophet, the true priest, the true king, all wrapped in one. Now each one of those things deserves probably a whole sermon of its own. We could probably spend hours unpacking all that that means. Here's the only thing I want to say for us this morning. What is your relationship with Jesus Christ? See, because Jesus didn't come to get a fan club. He didn't come because he wanted lots of admirers. There are lots of people in the world today who think pretty highly of Jesus. In fact, I was reading a couple weeks ago um, some things written by Bertrand Russell, who was a very well-known atheist and pretty hostile to Christianity, but he actually thought highly of Jesus as a person. There are lots of people who follow in that same line of thinking. Jesus didn't come to be admired. He didn't come just to have lots of people who thought highly of him. He came to be the prophet, the priest, and the king. That means for us that our lives must be surrendered entirely to him. There's no room for people on the fringes who kind of have a casual acquaintanceship with Jesus. Jesus came 
to be our ruler. He came to rule over us as our king. He came to deal with our sin. He came to be our teacher and our instructor. Now, in some ways, this is a challenge to us because, I don't know about you, but I want to be the boss of my own life, right? We don't want to surrender ourselves to anyone else. How do you surrender your life to Jesus? What is it that will compel us to surrender to him? Well, it's only when you see the full mission of Jesus, the full purpose. He didn't just come to be born in a lowly stable. He didn't just come to enter a world of poverty and in humility. He came to live the life and death that we could never live and die. He came to live the life we couldn't live so that one day he would die the death that we deserve. You know, some 30 plus years after the events recorded in Luke's gospel here in chapter 2 where the brilliance of the angels shone in the darkness that would be reversed and the brilliance and the light of God's face would turn to darkness as Jesus was on the cross and the rejoicing of the angels in in a sense would go silent as Jesus entered into the depths of hell why? to save us from our sin to rescue us from our greatest problem, to be a savior to us so that we might enter the presence of God. Right? That's why Jesus came. And that's why we rejoice. That's why we need not have fear. That's what compels us into mission. That's the good news of a savior who was born today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the gift of your son, Jesus, who was born into our world to take our place, to live the life of obedience that would be pleasing and acceptable to you, and to die the death that we deserve. Lord, because of that, we need not have fear. We can rejoice because your presence has come near to us. Because of that, Lord, we marvel as the shepherds did at at what you have done for us and, and we can't keep silent. How can we keep silent about this good news? And Lord, because of that, we have salvation from our sin. We rejoice in this. We thank you for this great and glorious gift. Help us each day to surrender ourselves fully and entirely to you. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.